thank you for being here in the house of the Lord today and I trust that God would speak something that would be meaningful into your life strengthen you and help you bless you in the way if you would turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Genesis Genesis chapter 2 This is called the book of beginnings. If you ever want to know how things are, how things are supposed to be, go back to the book of beginnings and get God's design for how it is scheduled to be. We learn that from the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 2. And notice verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul or a living being. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. I want to talk today from the subject of divine CPR. Divine CPR. Because there are many situations and circumstances in life that will really take your breath away. And you can call certain things as taking your breath away as a wonderful example of some things when something takes your breath away that can be an awe-inspiring moment then there are other things that take your breath away because you're in shock and the pain of what happens to you has knocked the wind out of you and it has taken your breath in that way and that's what we are trying to address because there are some things that you can go through in this life and life will knock the wind out of you. I, I, I think when I was playing football back in the day, and uh, it didn't take but one time for me to have the wind knocked out of me. I, I didn't even know that could happen. And uh, it, I don't know what happens in, in a situation like uh, having the wind. I guess you get hit so hard that you can only get a little bit of air in, but it seems like the air that you get in, you can't get it back out. And it seems to be something that actually takes your breath away. Well, you'll have some things, you know, that will hit you from a blind side because if you could see it coming, guess what we do? We get out of the way. But there are some things that come so fast and so hard that you can't see them coming and they will hit you and they actually knock your breath out. They will literally take your breath. And what do you do when you are laid out sprawled out on the ground trying to get your breath back how do we regain our breath we need somebody then to come and to administer to us divine CPR now you know that CPR from a natural standpoint is cardiopulmonary resuscitation where they are manipulating the heart and the lungs manipulation it has to do with manual using the hands and there they are they are pumping on you and sometimes break ribs in the process but in divine CPR you don't get any of your ribs broken thank God for that but there are things that can happen to you you can be in a bad marriage and be so fed up because you were hurt in the process of the divorce that the wind has been knocked out of you and it's like I never ever want to do that again you can be in a relationship with somebody in a business partnership with somebody and you can be with an unscrupulous person who lacks character and certain things you can lose and it'll make you where I never want to deal with other people again if I can't do it by myself I don't want to do it because the wind has been knocked out of you what do you do when you've had the wind knocked out of you and you need divine CPR and I'm gonna give you my version of what divine CPR is all about because we need 
new breath then to be put in us so that we can live. And if you ever want to get in a real emergency, I mean, before anything, you can have some major stuff wrong with you. But doctors are trained, particularly emergency physicians, are trained in the ABCs of medicine. And they all, you'd, you'd say ABC to an emergency physician, they immediately know what that means. It means to check for airways, to make sure the airways are clear, to make sure that the person is breathing and make sure that the circulation is intact. Because they don't want stuff to be pumping out, and but you're bleeding and it's pumping out and it's not coming back around. So they check airway, breathing, and circulation. Because they know that if they don't get those things under control, that cells in the tissue is going to begin to die. Brain cells are going to die. So you've got to administer. Before anything else is done, they can need a leg amputated. But if you don't take care of that ABC, make sure that the airwaves are clear that their breathing is intact and that the circulatory system is at what leaves the heart is then all going all the way around and coming back into the heart is not leaking out through uh, a hole in the femoral artery. You need it to come back to your heart. And so this is why we want to talk about divine CPR so that when the wind has been knocked out of you, there are people that have put their dreams on the back burner because something happened in their life and the wind was knocked out of them. And we don't want our wind to be knocked out of us. We need, in other words, to get a second wind so that we can run and do this thing again. We want God to live big in us. And we want to be able to receive the life of God. That's why you need, in divine CPR, what God begins to administer is inspiration. Say inspiration. Inspire means to breathe in. That means if you don't receive something in from God, you're going to be in trouble. We get inspiration in the house of God. There's inspiration that is built into God's Word. Inspiration, it is actually built into the Word of the Lord. Now let me give you what I consider to be divine CPR, divine CPR. Because notice, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. He became a living being. CPR, as I mentioned in the natural, deals with manipulation of the heart and lungs. But CPR in the spirit, divine CPR, I want to give it to you. It's courage, it's praise, and it's reason. And let me explain the three of those. Courage, praise, and reason. You see, discouragement is actually exhaustion of the human soul. Whenever you become discouraged, it means that your soul has run out of breath. And so you need to be encouraged. You'll find people that have run out of gas and they've stopped doing something that they love because people criticize them, tore them down, attacked them, and all of a sudden now you don't want to do it anymore. Because the person that you were doing it for, don't, they don't appreciate it. And it's knocked the wind out of you. You've had the very thing that you've raised to spit in your face. And it seems like they don't appreciate you. And that knocks the wind out of you. The very person that you gave your life to, that you've made sacrifices for. And then they turn around and hurt you and betray you. And the wind is knocked out of you. Now you need encouragement because... You've been discouraged. Discouragement is exhaustion of the soul. Every discouraged person, their soul has run out of oxygen. So when you encourage a person, you're actually putting them back in to the game. You're putting them back. Now, you have to give something out, but they have to receive something in. They have to inspire it to breathe it in. You expire, they inspire. You expire, they inspire. Life is a process of exchange. It is a process of exchange. We breathe in oxygen, we release carbon dioxide. Plants take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. It's a process of exchange. It is an ebb and flow. You have to give something and receive something. Give and receive. 
But discouragement is exhaustion of the soul. It means my soul is out of breath. You can get discouraged on your job. You can get discouraged in your marriage. You can get discouraged in motherhood and fatherhood. You can become discouraged in what it is that you're, you're doing. You can become discouraged in the use of your gift and discouraged because things are not going as well as you want them to go. Or things are not happening as fast as you want them to happen. And you become discouraged. But you know, there is a part of life in order to get certain things from God, you must go through process. And process means waiting. Waiting is always uncomfortable and many people become discouraged in the waiting process. But the Bible says, let him that minister wait on his ministry. Because whatever it is that you're ultimately gonna do, if it's gonna have significance and value, and if it's gonna last, you're gonna have to wait to get it. There's something about waiting that adds value to anything. When you wait before you partake of sex and, and, and virginity is broken in a covenant, that relationship has much more meaning than when a person has cheated the whole time. You let cheese age and it, it increases in value. That's why antiques have such great value because it has gone through a waiting process. And so it is waiting that makes things valuable. Things that don't mean very much today, but if you wait a hundred years from now, the little money that you got in your pocket right now will be of great worth just because you waited. I mean, if, if you don't even do anything else, just, just waiting. Because greatness comes over longevity. But a person needs the C, which is courage. They need to be put in courage. So they've got to be, in other words, encouraged. When you encourage a person, you become strengthened. But waiting for things is what wears people down. If you've got any single person, any, any, any single folks in the house today, single, wave your hand. My, whoo, look up there. Wow. Now folks waiting on the right spouse then they get discouraged, particularly as biological clocks begin to tick. They become discouraged because they said, you know, listen, I'm 29 and I'm not married yet. I'm 35 and I'm not married. I'm 42 and I'm not married. And they, 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 are, they become discouraged because of the waiting process. Just waiting alone can knock your wind out of you. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14? It says, the spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. If your spirit is wounded, if your heart is wounded, who can bear it? Who can bear it? But the spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, his weakness, the very thing that he's dealing with and struggling with. If he's got a strong spirit, it, he can endure. The spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear it? Who can bear it? And that's why hope deferred makes the heart sick if people have to wait too long. And if you ever notice how when Joshua had served Moses for many years and now Moses is dead, God had to speak four times in Joshua chapter 1 and tell Joshua, listen Joshua, Moses my servant is dead. But now Joshua, you're acting like a dead man. And God had to inspire him, he had to breathe into him. And when God inbreathed him, now what happens when Joshua begins to inbreathe him, Joshua begins to receive life. God's breathing in him the breath of life. And now Joshua becomes a living soul. How many times does God have to speak to you? And when you realize that God is speaking to you, that it's somehow it brings life to your soul. Yes, yes. I don't know how many times you might have been to this church and you heard God speaking to you. And you know that it brought life to your soul. Just because you heard God speaking to you. One of the reasons that God does not expect anything from you until he has put something in you until he has given you a word, he expects nothing from you. Did you know that? 
That's why God will do nothing, Amos 3, 7, until he, unless he revealed his secrets to his servants, the prophet. So the prophet can speak it out, and when they speak it out, now you have the power to do it because God has now invested in you. The moment that he has inbreathed you, you receive life, and the life of God comes in you. But God had to tell Joshua four times, Joshua, be thou strong and very courageous. Joshua, be of good cheer. Be of good courage. Only be thou strong and very courageous because it will take courage. And if you ever lose courage, you will sit out on the sideline and you will never try to live your dream only because you lost courage. But just realize that I believe that here are EMTs sitting all around here. And there are people that are passed out every place that you meet. You go to airports now, they've got defibrillators in the airport. They've got defibrillators in malls to help resuscitate people who have lost heart. And instead of using natural CPR to manipulate the heart, we want to inspire the heart. Divine CPR deals with inspiration of the heart and the lungs. God will give you a second wind. He'll breathe into you again because God expects nothing from you until he's put something in you. You ever notice that God will never ask you of something that you don't have to give? He only asks you to give what you have. God will never require of you something that you don't have the ability to do. If he requires it, then God is already telling you, you got it. If God has said, listen, I want you to be a leader, he's already saying a leader is in you. He will never require something from you that you don't have. So if he ever requires anything of you, it means that you've already got it. God only makes a demand on a deposit that's already been put in you. If you didn't have it in you, he would never call for it to come out of you. The call is to release what God has put in you. It means he's already put it in you. You've got it in you. But let me just remind you that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the result of the realization of the presence of God. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the result of the realization of the presence of God. It's just the result of the realization. And when I realize that God is with me, I have courage. How can God be with you and you be afraid? It doesn't mean that you're not around scary stuff. It simply means that I realize God is with me and I cannot be afraid. And then I love how the Bible talks about this real process of courage when you're giving CPR it is not a new idea it's not a novel idea at all if uh, in your Bible in Isaiah chapter 41 I mean you'll discover the principle it was way back in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 41 in, in verse 6 it says everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother be of good courage be of good courage so the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired or encouraged him who strikes the anvil, saying, is it ready for the soldering? Then he fasteneth it with pegs that it might not totter. So everybody, it has to become a contagion where everybody is learning to encourage his neighbor. What a different world this would be if people learn to encourage one another instead of complaining, griping, and criticizing against one another. If we learn to encourage, wouldn't it make a difference if somebody took the time to encourage your children other than you? And if you would go places and you were just encouraged and built up, when you're built up and encouraged by other people, it would affect your confidence level of what you can do and the positive outlook on your life just because people have been encouraged. I want to sensitize you to the degree that you begin to look for opportunities by which God can use you to encourage your neighbor. When you do that, that's divine CPR. You'll be just the breath of fresh air that they needed. You'll be just what they were looking for. Just what they were looking for. 
where everybody encouraged his neighbor. And the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith, and the goldsmith encouraged the one that worked, that, that worked with the anvil, and each one encouraged the other. That's giving courage to them. You'd be surprised how many people give up because they lose courage, because they become discouraged. The second part of divine CPR is praise. And uh, you don't just praise God every now and then. Praise is not a sporadic activity. Praise is a lifestyle. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. God inhabits the praises of his people. You know, in fact, in Psalm 145 and, and verse 4, the Bible says, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. One generation praises thy works to another. One generation praises to another to say, listen, baby, let me tell you what the Lord did for me. One generation praises it. And we got to have grandmothers and grandfathers now that are talking to their grandchildren. One generation praising it to another generation. To say, look, baby, it wasn't always easy for me to stay with your daddy, but let me tell you something. Listen, we need him where one generation, if, baby, if you'll keep your hands in the hands of the master. I mean, you, you'll be surprised what powerful strength that you can have when one generation is praising uh, the works of God to another generation talking about how wonderful God has been. But you'll discover that everybody needs a little praise from time to time. Now, I understand the principle. I've taught the principle for years that you reward performance. You reward performance. But you need to learn to praise effort. You praise effort. You'd be surprised how just praising effort will put wind back into them. You'd be surprised. It takes a lot to make an effort. When you finally see somebody making an effort to get up and do something positive, to, to work with you, whenever you see them making an effort to be cooperative, it, it might not be an equal effort, but it's an effort. It's, it's improvement for them. And you know what I'm talking about. When you see it, praise it. Praise it, praise it. I'm telling you, you will empower that person when you begin to simply acknowledge their effort, praise their effort, learn to praise. It'll put wind beneath their wings. It'll inspire their soul. It'll encourage them. It'll say, listen, I believe in you. Thank you for working with me. Thank you for being my partner here. I don't take you for granted. When you just acknowledge it, just acknowledge it, just acknowledge it. And then the R, the reason, the third element here is reason, reason. When I say reason, there are some people a lot of people that become discouraged in life because they do not any longer see a reason to live. They don't understand a reason for their being. And their life is a mere existence. They are not living. They're not thriving. They're just existing, but they don't even know why they're here. They feel like they're punished almost to have to wake up another day. You'd be surprised how some people's lives are so bad that they become despised depressed because they woke up the next morning. They were wishing that they had died in their sleep. They don't understand their reason for being. And for some individuals, you have to help them to see their gift and encourage them because you can see things in them that they cannot see in themselves. You'd be surprised how so many people are searching for a reason not to give up. But they're discouraged and they don't have a reason for living and they are discouraged and depressed. Their life is in dismay. And they're just looking for a reason. I need a reason to stay. I need a reason not to give up. What difference does it make anyway if I'm not here? They're just looking, searching for a reason. When you bring people courage, you bring them praise, and you give reason to them for why they are alive on the face of the earth and their worth and value to you. You're breathing life into them. Don't make your children feel like they're an accident, like they are an imposition. They are a blessing, low children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. They are not a burden, they are a blessing. 
And when we value them, something in our life changes. You don't know how many people who are right around you that have stopped breathing. And that's why God came out and prophetically spoke to Ezekiel. And he said, son of man, can these bones live again? And he said, Lord, you know. And then now here comes a command. If you want something out of them, you got to put something in them. You got to blow into them. He says, son of man, prophesy. Prophesy to the bones. Prophesy to them. And after he finished prophesying to the bones, then he said, prophesy to the wind. You need to prophesy to the atmosphere. You need to speak positive things out. You need to begin to release something. You need to blow into them. Don't curse the darkness, light a candle. You're just releasing something that's inspiring. You're releasing inspiration. Can these bones live again? You're discouraged, but can you live again? Absolutely. And it happens because God breathes on you in a powerful, powerful way. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.